Welcome, everyone, to the fifth episode of Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. We're here again with our two hosts, Gary Weber and Rich Doyle. We're excited to have everyone here who's joining us live and all the people who are joining us via the recording from around the world at whatever time you're connecting. Welcome. And I'd like to give a very brief introduction to our hosts and then we'll get underway. Professor Rich Doyle, a.k.a. Mobius, is a liberal arts research professor at Penn State University, where he has taught since 1994. He's uh, the author, recently, of a book, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Newosphere, which focuses on the coevolution of humans and psychedelic plants such as psilocybin cannabis and ayahuasca. Rich also was the co-host of one of our earlier web shows, Exploring the Soul of Nature, and he was also a host of a Penn State University collaboration we did called Radio Free Vallis, which is super amazing. And we're just glad to have him back again to do this with us. Really grateful to both of these gentlemen for making the time and offering their time freely to us. As, as you know, this, this show is uh, totally a gift to the community. So uh, Gary Weber, our other host, has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He's worked in many different industries, including the military, national labs, and academia. Uh, he has uh, written several books, most recently Dancing Beyond Thought, the Bhagavad Gita Verses and Dialogues for Awakening. And we're very glad to have him here uh, sharing his knowledge about meditation and self-inquiry along with Rich. Again, this, this session is powered by questions, as I mentioned, so keep them coming throughout and we'll get to as many as we can. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Rich and Gary. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, you know how this works, right? You know, we just get ourselves into a state. <laughs> <laughs> just, <think> <laughs> just conducive to questions and the questions come and they seem to tickle each of us in different ways and it creates a flow back and forth and we're looking forward to it. We never know what is going to manifest, and that's a beautiful thing. I also encourage people, if they think, they think they've got a question, but they're not sure if it's really a good question or the right question to ask, if they've thought about it, it's the right question. Uh, they're thinking about it. Somebody else is also thinking about it, too. So I encourage you to bring out the questions that you're afraid to ask or aren't certain about as well. Yes, it's. Uh, I just want to chime in there because on the other sessions I've seen in the chat, people being so happy that someone asked the exact question that they were shy to ask. Yeah. So that's your, you're speaking for others most likely when you uh, step up. I already have a few questions if you guys want me to uh, jump in. Sure. All right. Uh, Matthew asks, um, when I've been doing a lot of inquiry meditation practice, I've been experiencing a less solid, more expansive sense of self. However, it often leaves me in a dull, flat, lonely state. Will Gary and Rich please comment on this? Yeah, that's, that's very uh, common, in fact, it's almost de rigueur. Uh, what's happening is, you know, the brain doesn't, doesn't move this forward linearly like we might like it to take place. Uh, we've talked before a lot of things about, about how the brain comes in and does some deconstruction where it sees we're trying to you know, deconstruct the ego, the I with this self-inquiry. It does that, then it has to stop and clean out some debris from the stuff that is just reorganized and then rebuild a new place and then try it for a while and re-tear it down and keep the process going on and on. So you go through this period of what looks to us like charge, stop, charge, stop, or pleasant, unpleasant, pleasant, unpleasant. And if we could see the brain operating, thank goodness we can't, you'd see what's going on. The brain's probably pretty much actively working the whole time, but all we see is the intermittent pieces that appear to us in our consciousness. But actually, non-consciously, uh, what's happening is probably continuous, and just recognize this is part of the game as you're going to go through this start, stop, start, stop, start, stop thing. It feels unpleasant, then it feels great. It feels unpleasant, then it's great. That's what the process is taking place in the brain. This can also be a good opening to pair the self-inquiry and the meditation with a physical practice that's so that when there's the flat feeling, 
you can uh, do some physical work, which will focus the mind and really energize the body and maybe kind of like release some of that flatness. That's been my experience. I always found that the bicycle or the swimming pool or a walk uh, was a way to kind of recharge because what I would tend to do was then identify with that flat feeling. And then of course, do some self inquiry on that, but nonetheless, the flat feeling was sort of like to be a, be embodied by me. So if I did physical practice, it would um, tend to um, you know mitigate that quite a bit. Yeah, it's really important. Um, you know, physical practice of some kind, whether it's tai chi or swimming, or I've done tons of yoga. Some physical practice to you know disembody a lot of the things, stores you may have someplace locked into your body. So I think it's critical to have some kind of physical practice. Uh, if not, you have a good chance, if you're just you can love doing self-inquiry, just doing meditation really ardently, you may find yourself in one of these dark men of the souls, which we talked about maybe before, where you're just sitting there meditating, 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 you haven't done any con- deconstruction of the eye, you're not doing any physical practice, so you're really going to risk getting into some problems. And the best ways out of that are what we just, we just mentioned, do some physical practice. The more active it can be, the more you can work the body, the better it is at breaking up any kind of a problem you might have. And put self-inquiry in, make sure you're doing that so you are deconstructing the eye as you go along. If not, you can get an enormous ego that's heavily invested in your uh, arduous meditation program, but you can get stuck there and be in some very uh, difficult situations. Gary, what's your physical practice, may I ask? Uh, yeah, I mean, I had been doing, I do like an hour of yoga every day. Uh, what used to be very planful, I mean, I actually had a routine I went through. I followed that for many years, and I went through different, three or four or five different yoga schools, different types, some aggressive, some not so aggressive. Um, but now what I do is whatever spontaneously manifests. So I come down for the same two hours I've always pretty much done, pretty much the same time, like four or five o'clock in the morning. And whatever happens is what happens. It can be chanting, it can be meditation, it can be pranayama breathing practices, it can be yoga. Uh, just whatever pops up that the body and mind needs to do at that time is what takes place. But uh, I've been a yoga practitioner for a long, long, long time. There are things too, but I've been doing daily yoga forever. Great. Yeah, that was um, Matthew's follow-up question was whether, uh, and he thanks you for your response, uh, one of his follow-up question is whether you did recommend one physical practice over another, but it seems you were, in your answer it was whatever intuitively feels right. Yeah. So, cool. It, it's, it, I really would say that like I had no idea when I started doing lap swimming now almost 20 years ago where, that my body was telling me to do that, and I was just in a state where for whatever reason I was able to receive the message because I was probably in such distress. But I think it part of the good thing about Matthew doing these practices and getting still is it's from that space of stillness that you can feel what the body needs and then it will, you know, it'll happen. And it's yeah. also the, the great part of surrender practice. I mean, if this is practice is all about surrender ultimately. And we was talking, it really comes down to trusting that your body knows what it needs. And it will, in fact, do what it needs to do. It will lead you towards a process that's really what it's asking for. So be very sensitive to that. Surrender into it. My first yoga teacher's training was a surrender practice. You crank up some energy by chaotic breathing, fast breathing, and you just let go. And you just let the body do what it needed to do. It's very psychotherapeutic as well as physiologically. Uh, and enhancing. So I'm a big fan of doing something like that. Lead swimming or Tai Chi or running or biking, whatever it is, I go with it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that answer and thank you, Matthew, for your question. Uh, I have a somewhat similar question, but it's about the goal of, it se- well, it seems to be about kind of the goal of the path. So I'm going to ask, ask this. It's Ivan's question. Do you think that it's realistic that one feels happy or blissful 24-7 as a goal on this path? I feel like this has been a massive setup for me and that every time there is some discomfort, I feel like I still haven't quote-unquote made it. But isn't ev- awakening not just about feeling good all the time, but allowing everything to be? Thanks. 
Well, the other thing, I mean, I, I've been in this whole practice because I didn't want to suffer anymore. It wasn't so much about can I be blissfully happy because that, that, that happened, but I was just not interested in suffering anymore. So for me, it was just about not suffering. And I didn't want to suffer 24-7. So to me, the goal was not suffering, and that's why the, you know, to me, the self-referential internal narrative, the blah, blah, was the focal point. Because I could see my suffering was coming from that. And so I seized upon that as an indicator which I had available 24-7 tell me if I was doing the right practice or not. So I, I, I went more for, I just don't want to suffer as opposed to I want to be in bliss. Because you go for bliss, you push for pleasure, you're going to drive pain along with it. I was really into not suffering. Beautiful. Uh, Gary, if you could just move maybe a little closer to the mic, I just feel, or maybe just hearing a, you a little less clearly. Sorry about that. Uh, That's good. Something I would add there is that uh, in my experience, these kinds of, this is what I always call falling off and getting back on, you know, that the goal is not to never fall off. The goal is to learn that you can always get back on to the path. So a lot of times in my experience, this has been a sign of progress that one starts uh, doing so much better, you know, after maybe the early period where you actually see what your life is and all you see all the thoughts that are occurring, that you start to have periods of such uh, improvement that then something you, that you're, you're in a position to now deal with another issue, some chunk of brain real estate, as Gary would talk about it. And now all of a sudden you have a challenge and you feel like the whole thing's been a sham or I haven't made it and so forth. But these are beautiful moments for self-inquiry where you can really get in there and feel like, ooh, who's worried about not having made it? Who is that? Come on out. I love you. <laughs> Let me find you. Let me be with you. There's no problem. I'm not reproaching you. I just want to find you. Who's afraid of not having made it? And so... That's where those those moments are, in my experience, just delicious opportunities. They don't seem that way at first, but they're wonderful opportunities um, to really make, uh, you know, to let go of some major uh, stuff. That is the question that Rich says. Hmm. Who has this expectation? Who is unhappy with progress? Who is expecting something differently than what's happening right now? Can you just be now? Without any desire to be someplace else, someplace better, someplace uh, you have imagined might be the case. Just keep going back into who it is that has this hope, this expectation for eternal bliss. And strangely enough, when you do that, <laughs> a lot of that negative feeling goes away. So... So no problem. I mean, I, I know that the whole idea of a goal is, of course, you know, it's both motivating and problematic at the same time. But um, I, I do I do think that it's worth saying that, uh, you know, I don't think it's unrealistic to think that uh, we can experience our birthright of happiness and that our happiness is happening and manifesting most, if not all of the time. And that that's not an unrealistic pie in the sky thing any more than it's unrealistic to think that we breathe oxygen. It's part of who we are. Yeah, I'd also add on the idea of goals and uh, stopping thoughts. For me, that was an indicator, really an installed progress indicator that I could focus on easily. It was available. And I could see if my process was working or not. But I didn't sit there... Uh, 724, 60 seconds, uh, every minute, every hour, watching to see if it was slowing down right now or not. It was a question of either doing a practice, I would see, well, it's gone yet? No, it's not gone yet. But it's not obsessing about that. It's really an indicator for how you're doing. And you keep trying things, and over time, then, see how change takes place. But um, be careful with the goals. You can, you can get lost in the goals. The goal is now. Thank you, guys. And Ivan says thank you in the chat to you both. Uh, another question coming in. Jess, 
asks, have you seen the studies about hyperactivated partial lobes diminishing subject object boundaries? I was wondering if there are any new developments. The studies I saw centered around Ayurveda and religious studies in general mysticism, and it seemed to tie in with Zen meditation. Is it positive to always be Zen? Does that diminish other faculties of the mind if they aren't being employed? I haven't seen those studies. I mean, the hyperactivated ones in Ayurveda, I haven't been following that literature. I don't know what's going on in there. The uh, No, I, I have no good answer to that. I, that doesn't literature that I know. But we can follow up on the, the general question of, is, is there a downside to not dwelling in subject-object consciousness? Um, I haven't found one. Uh, it, it it feels like uh, you know what Ivan was referring to before is a much more expansive state. Um, there, uh, to me, one of the things that's been remarkable is noticing the kind of liberation from the social mind, the kind of dumbing down of our own experience and thoughts that happens because we're so busy guessing at what other people think of us and where we are in the hierarchy that greatly diminishes and the flow of ideas continues and the possibility of exploring the subjective space, which of course encompasses the objective space is, you know, an adventure and fantastic. So I'm not aware of those uh, studies either, but I can talk about the experience and say that one shouldn't worry about there being a downside to it that I've seen. There's no downside to being now, now, now. Cool. That's a great takeaway. (laughs) 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 If we just (laughs) sum it up. (laughs) I love that. Thank you. And thank you, Jess. If you have any follow-up, Jess, or if you have a link to that study that you'd like to share in the chat there, we could check that out later. That would be great. Um, Not to send you on a research mission, but if you have it handy. That would be great. Uh, just so we can look there, at there, it. Just, just a quick aside. There's a lot of sure. really fascinating research coming out now. I just got one, which and I were talking about beforehand on ayahuasca. I mean, the first real, honest to goodness, uh, top line journal now has an ayahuasca study on you know benefits, not so much benefits, but uh, what happens uh, pharmacologically, what happens in the brain what parts of the brain are activated, and it's very similar to what we've already seen before with magic mushrooms and with meditation. So people are getting into topics that were absolutely impossible to even entertain in the past, and they're now turning up in mainstream journals' uh, headlines. It is an amazing time of an opening, it feels like. Uh, Really kind of (laughs) mind-blowing what's showing up now. Uh, Thank you again, Jess, for the question. I'm going to move along to a question from Chris. And uh, Chris asks, in case, uh, sorry, I've struggled with some anxiety over the years, and it's usually tied into existential worries about the purpose slash meaning of life. Why are we here? Is life just a pointless eternal cycle, etc.? I wanted to know how and if non-dual awakening can alleviate such anxiety. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> it, it is the purpose of, <laughs> it, it certainly feels like it is the purpose of uh, human experience. It's, it's what we're for. I mean, that might be putting it a little bit too forwardly, but, um, you know, if, if, uh, if Chris will feel into what it feels like to be in that state when the existential anxiety is happening and the kind of like confrontation with the apparent meaninglessness of everything is occurring, then that's a beautiful moment to carry out self-inquiry and look for the one who is experiencing that because that jangly, bad, absurd feeling is the feeling of the ego trying to confront the kind of enormity of everything that it doesn't think it is. And it can be so liberating and soothing to reflect on the one thing that's probably not being reflected on, which is who's reflecting, who's looking at this existential situation. 
Yeah, self-inquiry, I think of all the techniques I've, I've run across, is about the only way to deal with that, that great angst that many, many people feel. What am I here for? What is my purpose? Who am I? Instead of asking, but ask the question deeply, and you find out that, in fact, what, what is it, as Rich was saying, that is experiencing this heavy angst. There's something there that is unhappy and disquieted. It also, this, this ego that's all having all this problem, is the very same one that keeps worried about, oh, am I in control or not? Do I have free will? Because it's running around, recognizing, either non-consciously or consciously, that in fact it can't be in control. It sees it's trying to be in control, it's not working. It keeps trying new approaches, new things, let's try this thing, let's try that thing. None of it works. So the ego gets frantic about this. It's not working. This thing isn't happening for me. Yeah, I must be a failure. That's where the angst comes from. You can feel your way into that. That's where the problem is. The ego is, un is not up to the task. And so it has a lot of worry about this whole thing. It's the one that has the problem. There is no, again, no problem in now. It's just the ego running out of now, trying to make up stories about it, and recognizing it's incapable of delivering on the goods it promised. It sees itself come and go, right? Or, you know, part of our mind sees the ego come into existence. And when we're confronting that meaning, that apparent meaninglessness, and the ego is imagining its future death, which is a kind of impossible thing, of course, for it to do. So it cycles on and on and on. Um, the one thing that never occurs is to wonder who it is that is going to die. And the liberation that can uh, ensue when you kind of see that there is no stable self here, no self, nobody here that has been born and nobody here to die. It's such a funny and hilarious kind of immortality that you can't even get over it because you've been worried about the wrong thing the whole time. Um, and so, yes, that I can't encourage you enough, Chris, to really practice some self, simple self-inquiry in those moments of, you know, such deep anguish and anxiety and to treasure those moments in a way as gifts because you're being given the opportunity to awaken from, you know, this dream. And so when you're given that opportunity, the only way to awaken from it that I know of is to really ask who's dreaming it. And when you do that, it's just, because it feels so bad, it's so liberating and and uh, freeing. So, yes. But, but that is one of the almost daily questions I get somehow. People say, I started self-inquiry, it felt great at first. Now it's not feeling very good. Now I feel like I'm really getting spacey. I, just, I get really uneasy. I get frightened. It's the same entity we're talking about here. That is seeing that, in fact, it is being deconstructed, that it is not constituted as a whole entity. It's beginning to fragment. It can see that's happening. And it, it's afraid of this process. It's terrified of this process going ahead, which was saying. It wants to be present for its own funeral. It's not going to happen. I mean, this, the ego is going to get deconstructed. It's going to be very unhappy about this thing. It's going to try many ways to stop this, to derail it, to... Uh, somehow devalue it, make it not be useful, but it's all this panicked routine going on. Underneath that, there is something that's not changing. It is very still, placid, uh, untouched by all of this wild perambulation that's going on with the ego, trying to find some way to stop this process. That's where the angst comes from. It's scared of its own mortality. Not yours, it's mortality. Uh, Chris has a follow-up question. Um, some have theorized that anxiety may be a symptom of a spiritual awakening, maybe as you guys say, the ego deconstructing. Do you think this may be the cause for anxiety in some cases? Seems. Yeah. You do. Certainly yeah. was in mine. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it'd be astonishing if you didn't have anxiety. If there wasn't egoic anxiety, the process isn't working. I mean, very, just start asking, where am I? And very powerfully, when am I? I like when am I because it shows you very quickly, and people start using it, 
And in fact, they find they are different ad hoc entities showing up at different times for different relationships and situations. This is not a constitutive whole entity we're talking about here. You can very quickly see that when you ask when am I, you see that it's not there all the time. When it does show up, it's a different I every time. Shorts is panicked. It should be. It's, <laughs> you can see it's not real. It's not one thing. It's just a program that's running. Yesterday, I was riding my bicycle, and it was uh, the perfect time of day for the sun uh, that was in the west uh, to throw my shadow directly to my right as I was riding. And I, and I looked in, and saw my shadow, and I recognized that I was not my shadow. And in, and in seeing that I was not my shadow, I also saw that I was not the person on the bike. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's not real. Exactly. He's not real. Yeah, so, <laughs> because the same criteria that lead the shadow to not be real, you know, it's fleeting, it's not substantial, it's, it changes according to the time of day and so forth, uh, were immediately experienced uh, on the bicycle. And it's just so funny and it feels so good to see that. Like, you know, and, and like every now and then something will come up that gives me anxiety of the sort you're talking. And it's, it's almost like a treat in the sense that I feel it coming, I get it on behind it, I be with it. It doesn't last more than 15 minutes of like total meaninglessness. And some chunk of some aspect of my alleged self was holding on to something deeply. And, and it's usually, and then after the fact, kind of laughable, you know. But it feels so good. And, and the measure of how good it's going to feel is how bad that anxiety feels. The intensity is equal and opposite for when it is is let go. So I would say absolutely yes. That that the that, that's one of the reasons why the anxiety is a gift because it's saying hey, there's something not right here. And there's a mismatch between who you think you are and what the world is. So good luck. We said we said this before. So this is a very tactile journey. Uh, you are the best judge you can, can possibly be of what's going on in your consciousness. If you can feel places where there's a some kind of a collapse in consciousness or a, a rise up in consciousness of something that's unpleasant, as soon as that rises up, you can see, okay, there's something that, that how does it feel? Does it feel as good as consciousness does, as stillness does, as the unchanging background does? If it feels different, then how good does it feel? Does it feel bad? And it feels bad, then you can move into it. We talked before about the Sedona method or Byron Katie or just surrender, just saying yes to this unpleasant uh, point that arises in consciousness. Accept. Just let go of it. This this scent of something. Just let go of that and see if it can go away. Move into it and let go of it. Hmm. That's super reassuring to hear you guys talk about your own anxieties still <laughs> that's uh, comforting at least to me personally um uh and and gary you just mentioned the sedona method i have a question about that here so i think i'll jump to that from jake it's a little different topic but do you find that the sedona method is effective in dealing with feelings of lust and sexual arousal oh absolutely yeah the sedona method uh, there's some controversy about uh, who has the rights to it anymore. There's a dispute about that still ongoing. But it's very simple. It's just you see something arise. It can be an emotion, sensation, lust, desire, whatever. And feel your way into that and say, could I let go of this? Oh, I don't know what we just talked about. And the second question is, would I let go of this? Is it useful to me to have this thing? Does it really serve me? And then you find say, well, if I can't let go of it now, is there some time in the future I can let go of it? In fact, you can find, we found out now how well this works very well, and you can develop into a heuristic. So the brain actually does this very quickly, recognizes it, recognizes the problem, the uh, difficulty, and says, could I, would I, when, bang, 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 and the thing is like a, you know, a zapper. It's just gone. A decision can arise. But lust, desire, absolutely. One thing we talked about before, just when you see 
lust and desire emerge. You see a person of the opposite sex, or desirable sex, whatever it is, and you say, okay, that's a pointer back to me right now. I've got an exact pointer back into where is my desire? What am I lusting for? Who is it that has this desire? And then could I let go of this desire? You will find you're very attached to the, to the huge desire, and you're attached to the story about the desire. This imagination you have of what it might be like, what it was like last time, what, what will this person be like compared to the last person? Just watch those stories come rolling out and just ask yourself, could you let go of these stories? They're just stories. There is a, certainly, a certain amount of Darwinianly encoded, um, I recognize a different form. I recognize that's a potential partner for me, sexual partner for me. Past that, though, Vast amounts of this whole uh, lust and craving thing is emotional. It's just mental stuff that we've caught, we've made up, and stories about it. Get rid of the stories. The past time, your bad memories, your big expectations, what you saw on TV, what you saw on porn flick, whatever. Let go of it. Just let go of that, and see how much of it is really, honestly, a true feeling that you have, absent any kind of story about it. And what's amazing that when you let go of the story about it, or you ask who it is who's having this craving, what and if anything ensues, what ensues is so much more beautiful and remarkable than it is when there are two people who are trying to, or, or you know, who are interacting through story. When you're actually present for it, like what you've been looking for is being present for and with another person. And ironically, the stories and the craving associated with the lust uh, and, and sexual desire actually get in the way of just being with that. If the body is trying to find out something, is trying to achieve something, and then the ego comes in and makes a story about what that means, and the story of what it means is like completely a non sequitur compared to what is. And when what is occurs, it's beautiful and fulfilling and destined to happen, I suppose. But when there's all this story, it's basically destined not to happen because there's so much ego getting in the way. So even when it happens, it doesn't happen, if that makes sense. Yeah, and there's some just quickly on internet porn because it is such a big topic now. It's 35, 40 percent of the amount of consumption of bandwidth on the, on the internet. I believe most most studies, wow. and it's pervasive. And it's interesting. You know, the, the original story, you know, the backstory had been that in fact, internet porn is good because it frees us up from our inhibitions. What they're finding out, what the psychologists and psychiatrists are finding out, people show up in their offices. And in fact, the exact opposite thing happens. And in fact, the porn is so um, hyped up, you can't possibly measure up, nor can your partner measure up. And so this becomes a, a, you know, an unwinding problem where you end up losing your desire completely because you've been watching so much internet porn. And if you've been uh, masturbating to internet porn, in fact, it, it drives this deeper and deeper, it turns it into an addiction. And this, they talk of there's now addiction to porn problems they've got the psychologists are dealing with. Because people, if they masturbate to porn, what they get is a big reinforcement. You watch porn, you get an orgasm that dramatically locks up this model. I watch porn, I get pleasure. I watch porn, I get pleasure. Until it doesn't work anymore. I mean, it goes through the same kind of problem we get with all addictions. You satiate, you're, you're, you want the thing more and more and more, and you're getting less and less and less out of the, out of the feeling of the process. So you have to ask for more and more extreme versions of it. So the, internet, the porn addiction is a, is a real problem right now. For many people, what happens to the end result is that you lose your desire completely and your ability to perform. And so you've, you've unwound the very reason you thought you were going to put this in the first place. And so your sex may become something you don't want to do anymore, you don't care about anymore. Because you've locked in, you've become addicted to the model you had of watching and then getting an orgasm out of it. It really takes you the wrong direction. It's a big problem right now. We want to talk about it, so there's a big problem right now. Hmm. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, Jake, who asked the question, says, thanks, guys. And his follow-up, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the Sedona method and self-inquiry? I notice Sedona method is very effective for me, but I feel like I'm making very little progress with self-inquiry. Thanks. Yeah, they, I think they play back and forth. Uh, what, that, it wasn't around for a long time. Sedona wasn't around. Byron Katie came on earlier than that. But that vehicle wasn't there when I first started. I wish it had been. It wasn't, but that's the way it was. But to me, it's a very uh, nice back and forth. I mean, I do self-inquiry. Stuff comes up. Stories arise. Physical practice brings forth some questions that you can't find another way to deal with. Something gets very persistently unlocked, and you've got this repetitious going on and on in your mind. You can't find a way to stop it. It's amazingly, Sedona works. When I first heard about it, I thought there's no way it can be that simple. Me just looking at something and saying, could I let go of this? Would I let go of it and when? I couldn't imagine it would actually do any good at all. But in fact, it just vaporizes thing after thing after thing. I'm a big proponent. And if self-inquiry is not working for you, Jake, I mean, shift off to something else. We've had this discussion before. But shift your question. Shift from a question to another question, to an affirmation, a negation, a try chanting or something. There are lots of ways into this thing. The eye is going to try to blunt whatever way you come up with. Its future depends upon this thing. See if you can find some other way to do yourself inquiry. At the same time, keep working with Sedona or Byron K, whatever works for you. But play them back and forth, left hand, right hand. Self-inquiry of some sort, uncovering things. And then as they come up and you can't get rid of them, then go with Sedona or Byron K to, to unwind them. It's a, it's a great back and forth. I wish it had been around. I wish more people knew about it because it's a very powerful pair to work with. And and to me, they, they both get to the same place in the sense that, like, like could I let go of that leads me to the question of who would do it, right? Who, who's letting go of that? And so to me, they feel like they're, they, they bring my, my, my attention. They focus my attention to the same inner place where my attachment is. And so, you know, maybe if you fold the self-inquiry question into the Sedona method, you know, maybe towards the end where you say, well, who would do any of those things that I just discovered? You know, what, can I let go of it? Who would, you know, when could I let go of it? Could I let go of it in the future? And who would let go of it? Because then you're letting go of the one who lets go of it. And, it, and they, they all, to me, again, feel like tactically as if they're getting me to a very similar place. So uh, it could be that just adding it in there on the end there might work for you, Jake. Or as Gary's saying, you know, chanting is just such a beautiful thing. And for some reason, we don't want to do it. I don't know why. But... It's so clearing and emptying and cleansing and energizing for no good reason to do it. It probably is doing some pranayama when you're doing it, right? Uh, and just, it's beautiful and you can always do it. And you can, and I, well, a very important practice that I had even before I met Gary was all day mantra, japam. I'd be chanting things internally all day long and just starts doing it itself. So let, you know, let your mind get still enough to, that some technique comes to you. And if the self inquiry is not working, you know, let something else, as Gary said, just take it, take its place. The blog post that went up yesterday, uh, if you guys saw it, it was about music and what, how music can therapeutically, plastically modify the brain. It was applied to Alzheimer's and autism and, all kinds of maladies of sorts. It was also applied though to, you know, how can you strengthen the brain? How can you improve its operation? And there were two techniques developed, MIT, I think in the other one. It was very similar, but the idea was to go in with intonations and with changing words and changing phrases and sing them. It's yeah. basically chanting. Yeah. It's chanting. And so how they how they got rid of all these things, the autism things and the Alzheimer's was to do that process with them. This one person had a, a brain injury, been shot in the head. The person had a stroke on the left-hand side of the brain. 
it's very powerful for these kind of things to do something. It's basically chanting. Nobody wants to use the word chanting in a scientific article, but it is an astonishingly powerful technique. I didn't know about it when I first started out, but I'm, as Rich was saying, amazed at how powerful it is. And as you change from one chant to another, how different the energy yeah. is. You can yeah. feel the energy shift. You can feel the energy change. You're, you will like one and not like the other ones. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of something like chanting. It can loosen up things you hadn't seen before. And if you do things like watching where the chant comes from and where the chant goes to, it can be an amazingly powerful practice into deep inquiry. I'm a big fan of that. And if nothing else, at first, it'll crowd out the other thoughts. Right? You know, there's no space in there for anything but Om Namah Shivaya or, you know, Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisattva or, you know, they can be simple, they can be different, you know, they can be complicated, you can be drawn to something, but there's not, no other room in there if you're doing that. Well, it really is neuroanatomically no other room because yeah. the broke is there, it's on this side of the brain which is where you speak from, it's your speech origination center, uh, it can only do one thing at a time. It can either do blah, 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 or it can do a chant. You find, you watch yourself with, when you chant, even when you talk sometimes, it's very difficult to have self referential narrative, especially the chanting, because it entrains the mind, the brain likes the music, it likes the sound, it grabs many different parts of the brain, so it ties up a lot of different areas, and it gets those all entrained and working together. It's a really powerful technique that people don't use enough. We sing sometimes, but people don't like to sing out loud. They think they're, you know, won't be as good as the best person they've ever heard. But it's, you can get a great power out of this just by chanting by yourself, even if you think you aren't a great chanter. It's just such a beautiful, powerful process. Well, thank you, guys. Jake says thank you for that amazing answer. Uh, uh, yeah, chanting uh, something new for me as well and really enjoying it. Um, so I have a question from Fareed who says, uh, I have a friend who suffers from one of the most painful diseases and she is trying very hard to overcome this through following a spiritual path in stillness but finds it impossible to surpass this pain in her way to salvation. What can she do practically to help herself when she is in that pain? Well, the biggest thing that I found helpful with people who have chronic pain, and even severe chronic pain, is to see if they can parse out the difference between pain and suffering. I mean, the pain, there's nothing you can do about it. Not much you can do about it. You can do something. There's not much you can do about it. The suffering part, the stories about the pain, are where you can really do some effective, useful work. And that's where you get into, you know, who would you be without these stories? This gets back to Sedona Method and Byron Katie again unwinding the stories about the pain. It's never going to end. This is terrible. Why me? What did I do wrong? Why is, why is God punishing me? Whatever it is, whatever the stories are, just try to neutralize the stories and get with the pure pain. That's the best way you can do to get the thing cranked down to a manageable level is to get rid of the suffering, the stories you're creating about the pain, which you probably can't do too much about. And, you know, that's a way of pointing towards, you know, in uh, the practical matter of just of learning how to observe the pain. Like I'm hoping that the pain is intermittent, um, you know, that it's not just simply continuous. That can make it difficult to like, you know, get a practice at all going that allows you to simply observe it. But if you can observe your thoughts and observe your bodily responses to your environment, if you can observe the words coming out of your consciousness and out of your mouth, just watch and practice that witnessing. Maybe with the self-inquiry included saying, you know, who's who's saying these words. Then when the pain comes up, you're observing it just as pain. It's not you. There's a distinction when, when you're telling those stories that Gary was talking about. That's kind of knitting you together with the pain and making a suffering story out of it. Whereas if it's very strange is to experience pain just as pain, not suffering. It's just, it's just what it is. I, I don't know else how to put
put it into words, but I've experienced it such that it's just a very odd uh, phenomenon. It, it, and it's kind of, it's not that it's happening to someone else, but it's not really happening to me in my observing consciousness. Now, of course, one falls in and out of that, but the more you can practice, as Gary is saying, distinguishing first between pain and suffering and doing that distinguishing, that discernment by just observing the pain and then turning the consciousness around and looking and seeing who's observing it. And when you do that, the pain is there, but it's not you. And so there's just a kind of angstrom or, you know, of difference between you and the pain that is, you know, salvational. Because when you're identified with that pain, it's true. There's just no, you know, it's the crucifixion. You know, you're, 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 you're in it. But if you can learn how to observe it, and that has to be practiced and done not just when you're in pain is the issue. So if there's can be anything intermittent to it, then the practice of just observing, you know, what does the water feel like when I'm in the bath? What does it feel like when I'm eating? What does it feel like when I'm taking medicine? What does it feel like when I first wake up? What does it feel like when I'm about to go to sleep? I'm just observing. Who's doing that? Then when the pain spikes, you can take the same observational point of view. And if it's an inflammatory issue, then in my experience, and this is going to be in, in the di uh, dialogue that Gary and I are putting together into a book, in my experience, the inflammation itself will go down over time when you just observe it and aren't engaged in this wheel spinning regarding the pain. You know, my sympathies to your friend. I, I hope she can take something away from this and um, take a, a witnessing perspective on the pain and distinguish it between between pain and suffering. Hmm. Thank you both. Um, Fareed, if you have any follow-up, please let us know in the chat. Chris mentioned, uh, Fareed says, I hope she will, and thank you so much for that. Uh, Chris mentioned a comment, um, I've seen footage of monks doing self-immolation, lighting themselves on fire, and they seem to not feel the pain. Can physical pain be transcended with enough mental consciousness training? Kind of follow-up. Uh, I guess you're saying can to some degree. Well, I think it's a waste of time. Uh, one, one of the people who uh, got all the attention maybe 25, 30 years ago when we first started to do uh, cognitive neuroscience on extreme meditators. I'm almost in that class, but, but um, it's just from time doing it. But the whole idea that you can stop things, I think, is an enormous waste of time. Uh, the Tibetan monks are river wrapping themselves up in uh, soaked sheets, and sitting out in the ice cold, and that's a demonstration of something. Uh, one of the big excitements was they found this fellow who could actually stifle an eye blink. It's a very primitive response we have that we get something coming towards our eye, we blink our eye. This would seem to be a very good thing to me. <laughs> People have spent literally decades learning how to try to stifle their eye blink response, and there's been much excitement about this, in some of the research journals. Look at this fellow, he can actually shut down his eye blinking response, which to me is an enormous waste of human energy. So for what? What is the point? And wrapping yourself in, in sheets and sitting outside in you know, desire to be weather. Interesting, yes, but are, are these people free of pain? Or are they free of their own suffering? Like, wandering around India, you see people who have their arm up in the air for 25 years. Yes, he can do that. His arms shriveled, it's just bones and stick and sinew. These hells are up in the air for 25 years. He said, well, what's the point of that? I mean, is he really free of his suffering if he has to hold his arm up in the air for 25 years? I just, I don't see any pragmatic value to it. We can push the human body all kinds of different ways. We've done that. But I would sooner say, look, just do some self-inquiry and ask yourself, who's putting your arm up in the air? Who's trying to stifle their eye blink response for 20 years? What's the point? What are you trying to, are you trying to egoically demonstrate your superiority to the rest of the human race? Is that what this is about? And if it is, solve your ego problem as opposed to solving your eye blink problem. Your eye blink problem is just a normal protective response. Why would you try to kill that? 
Mm, great answer. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Yeah, so many great questions coming in. Just going to keep it moving if you guys are cool with that. Uh, thank you for these answers, Gary and Rich. Um, so, yeah, I have a question from Shaw. And Shaw asks, I'm stuck with the idea that I am the possessor of awareness, which turns awareness into a thought, into something that I have instead of something that I am. How can I stop seeing awareness as another kind of thought produced by the mind? Great question. Um, well, uh, I don't know if you're doing uh, meditation or not, but um, if you do enough sort of simple zazen, just sitting meditation, uh, and you do a physical practice that allows you to be comfortable for long enough, it seems, seems to be about 35 minutes. Um, then the awareness that, uh, you know, that one is experiencing takes on an expansive quality and sort of, uh, just forgets that there is a possessor to the awareness that kind of like ordinary experience we have with, uh, an awareness. So, uh, persistent practice of meditation uh, probably in the morning and at night or once a day at about 35 to 40 minutes can do that. Um, more practically, probably for most of us during the day, if you really start asking this question, who is having this thought, right? So turning into the thought, you have a thought, who's having it? Then, uh, and, and at first doing that with even like the most kind of mundane like simple tasks, like I'm drinking a hot chocolate. Who is drinking the hot chocolate? And you might think, oh, well, that's the moment you're going to scald yourself and pour hot chocolate on yourself. No, you're just looking, you're just taking your awareness and turning it back onto itself. And by turning your awareness back onto itself, it's going to see eventually that that presupposition we have, that there is a possessor having the thought there. It's just that it's a presupposition. It's like that shadow I saw when I was riding my bicycle. It's a it's an effect of thought. It's not the um, creator of the thought. And once you start to get little inklings, it is, as Gary was saying, very beautiful to be able to start watching, for example, where do my thoughts come from? Where do my words come from? And really be with that place. It can take time, but not a lot of time, you know. Uh, so if you do those two things together, um, it can uh, you you can definitely get there. Now that said, if you need a bootstrapping uh, practice, like in other words, you just what I'm saying doesn't make any sense to you. You don't get that expansive feeling, or you don't really get anything when you ask who's having that feeling because you're maybe dwelling on the level of language and you're not like using your conscious to really point at your consciousness. I can't recommend uh, highly enough um, flotation tank practice as a way of bootstrapping meditation to finding a flotation tank um, near where you live and doing at least two sessions. But if you can get into a regular practice, that, that can be a good thing. I'm not saying you have to do it like, you know, more than four or five, six times, actually, for some people, it becomes their practice. But it can really very quickly disabuse you of that idea that you are somehow the possessor of your awareness. Um, that said, there's also good data uh, on psilocybin, if you can use that uh, in a safe context and look at the screening that a place like Johns Hopkins uh, has applied to uh, um, their subjects that uh, there's very good data, that there's a kind of uh, a, a decrease in the default network that allows for that kind of I thought to diminish. So there's no shortage of techniques, uh, but I think what it calls for is the actual ambition to experience it and the persistence to get there. And in a way, the belief that the state exists. And I can tell you that the state does exist and that meditation, flotation tank, self-inquiry are all in completely valid avenues for getting there. And that if you do those things, you will experience them. 
I don't know if she has a follow-up. Yeah, if there's uh, something you want to mention as a follow-up, let me just check in here. Great. Uh, nothing yet, but thank you for the question. Um, I'm going to move move along then. Uh, Shaw, yeah, if you want to chime in just any time, let me know. Uh, I'm going to ask a question from Tara. Tara asks, can you speak to the energy of avoidance or the effort of holding space to keep an experience away? Maybe also in relationship, relation to the energy of holding space to keep a certain experience in the focus of awareness. Mm. Yes. Um, well, first of all, those feel to me like two very different kinds of energy of uh, holding space uh, in order to keep focus on awareness and holding space to keep something away. Thank you. Uh, the first, to keep something away, uh, is probably the one that's more familiar to us. The question is about um, kind of using awareness to hold something away. And to me, and I apologize if I sound repetitious, to me this is why self-inquiry was su such an uh, you know, illumination. Because um, there were, I got to a point where there were things that I just needed to keep away. And I had even evolved techniques for just blanking my mind so that they weren't there until they came back. And so they were sufficiently persistent when they came back, almost like diabolical entities. And that it was only by asking who is having the experience of these things that I'm trying to hold away, who's holding this away, that I could relax into actually experience what it was I thought I was holding away. And inevitably, you know, basically laughter would result because this big bad thing that I was trying to keep away, what I thought was associated with some sort of trauma, was in fact nothing of the sort. It was a kind of trace of a memory of the past of something that probably never happened. So you can feel the difference between that and the, and then the energy of quote unquote holding a space so that you can keep focused on awareness. Because to me, the energy of holding a space to keep focused on awareness is the energy of surrender. It's the energy of maintaining complete openness to, uh, pure awareness to turning my consciousness back and looking at pure awareness. And when I'm doing that, it feels there's no feeling like this holding away. There's no clenching. There's no, there's just the dancing with the flow of experience that is coming to me. So to me, they feel very different. And the first one is the one that has to be worked with because the first one you can get behind with self inquiry. There's just, no, it has no defense against self-inquiry. Yeah, I, I missed the upfront part of that bit of tea. Um, it was about using uh, holding awareness to hold things away and try to focus on your awareness practice. I see many, many people who have done decades of the in the practice, and uh, they have not solved their problems. I mean, you can develop a lot of a very highly skilled meditational, devotional, meditational practice to block out things that you don't want to face. Mr. to Rich's point, I mean, that's why I, you know, Zen has two main practices, pra you know, meditational practices. One is basic, is Soto Zen, which is basically mindfulness. The other one is Rinzai, which is to go into it, directly attack, ask, inquire, or go after the, the problem. And I went for the latter. I tried to form her, it didn't work for me. And I could see the problem I was having was that I was really avoiding my problems by trying to block them out of the way. And not until I went into inquiring deeply into who had these that I had any vehicle to even unearth them. You were talking earlier about the Sedona method, this could I let go of this? If you ask that question, could I let go of this sensation, emotion, whatever story? If you feel into the texture of that, this is a very tactile journey. You just feel the structure underneath the original thing. You think, oh, this is about X. And you find as you get into it, you let go of X and say, oh, it's not just X. There's Y and Z underneath that. 
And you begin working down into Y, you say, oh, it's not even just about Y. There's Z in here, too. So you unpack these things by going directly into them. You cannot ever resolve those things by just pushing them off to the side. You may have long, deep ago fears from who knows what. Uh, I've read a lot of people who've been abused as kids uh, of all different kinds of ways, and they often wall that off completely. They just say, I, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to face that. It's too painful. I'll just forget about that. Well, but you never forget about it. It's always running there in the background. You may not even be consciously aware of it, but it's in there. And you can go into there and start by unpacking. If something feels like it's not okay over in this corner, and you move towards that. And you think, oh, it's about this. And you start digging into it, and you see it, in fact, you begin peeling the onion down, you find out that it really isn't about X. It's about Z. And Z is a big, nasty thing, but you got to keep going into it. And if you move deeply into it, you'll find it doesn't matter anymore. It was something that happened to somebody else a long, long time ago. It wasn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. You just need to let go of it. Those stories are no longer useful to you. So just let go of those stories. Because you have to go into them and, and deal with them, be present with them, and feel them until you can let go of them and then be free of them. And, and something that might give you the courage to do that, and I, I do think the word courage is appropriate, although nobody really has it. It's just the, it's an event. It's realize that you have pure awareness on your side. Once you... Turn awareness on these things, as, as Gary is saying, going from X to Y and Z. They can feel difficult because what feels difficult is the holding away. That is the pain, is the holding away. But the reason why the Sedona method works, for example, is because once you shine awareness on it, it cannot survive. There, it is not possible for it to withstand that pure awareness. And uh, something I wanted to share that might also give you courage is that to maybe look into uh, possibly, you know, supplementing your practice with a bhakti technique of choosing an avatar, having an avatar choose you and asking yourself if there's any difference between you and that avatar. Right. Like, you know, here's Jesus. Is there anything in me that is not Jesus? Here's Krishna. This is. Is there anything in me that is not Krishna? Here's Shiva. Is there anything that in me that is not Shiva? And Gary, you know, really uh, kind of turned me on to this, validated something that I've sort of been coming up with intuitively. And it's very powerful because it brings that pure awareness, you know, to the fore. You can feel that you have that energy on your side, as it were, and that there's nothing to be afraid of in X, Y, and Z. The only thing to be afraid of, quote unquote, is you're holding away of X, Y, and Z, which is what hurts. That is the problem. This whole uh, bhakti devotional thing, I think, is worth talking about for a few minutes. Uh, Mama Maharshi was a big uh, yani, a big inquiry person. He, he you know, revitalized self-inquiry as a practice that's been gone for a long time. It's hopefully back alive and well now. Uh, but the other side of him was a very deep bhakti practice, which was devotion. He had devotion to a particular mountain where his ashram was located. And I put that off to the side and said, well, I'm just going to do self-inquiry. It's a brilliant, beautiful practice, and I'll just do that. And I did that, and the page eventually turned. But I kept thinking, wondering about, well, this bhakti practice, you know, he was such a brilliant person on this inquiry thing. Is he missing something? Is it just South Indian devotional people who are, you know, kind of lost in Hinduism, this bhakti practice they have? Is it an old artifact of animism or something? And so, but I found myself getting drawn into that, thinking, well, maybe there's something here. And so I started, the bhakti practice manifested for me spontaneously. I just found avatars, iconic figures that interested me, that talk to me. It pulled me in somehow. I, I couldn't get back into Jesus again. I've been a Christian and I walked away from that for all, all kinds of reasons. But I found other iconic things that I could get really into. As, and as I found my way into this practice, as Rich was describing eloquently as he usually does, 
this idea that you old story in Indian bhakti is well, I want to be different from sugar. I mean, sugar's out there, Jesus is out there, Krishna's out there, Shiva's out there, whatever, but I'm back here. And I want to be I want to be out there enjoying the presence of this iconic figure in my life, bringing joy to me for being, I love this thing. The transition, the big transition for non-duality is to move into a place to where you are not different from the iconic figure that you've posited out there. And you try to see, where am I not the same as this iconic figure? If I am everything, as the mystical experience is for non-duality, then I must also be that iconic figure. I must also be the energy that I get from that particular object, avatar, whatever. And so I keep working this back and forth. You can feel out there, which was saying, there's Shiva, I'm back here. There's Jesus, I'm back here. Christians don't, when I was a Christian, weren't allowed to do that. I mean, you couldn't imagine yourself being one with Christ. And yet, has, Rich has this beautiful course he's teaching on the Bible from non-dual perspective. He doesn't call it that, but something like that. But where you, there are passages in the Bible that can only be explained by recognizing the fact you and Jesus are one thing. You are not different from them. They, don't, they are not out there in some place you can't attain. You can attain that. You can actually become that space, and it's really a, an enormously powerful way to get rid of any little artifacts of your ego that might still be lurking around in the corners. With the, without this kind of a practice, and this is one of the problems I think many of the traditional Buddhists have, is they don't have an iconic figure. I mean, they kind of put Buddha into that position, but that wasn't what he asked for. Um, they don't have something that's superior to them to bow, to, to let down into, bow down into, recognize it's superior to them, and then become absorbed into. They just don't have that. And so there's no way to ultimately disabuse their egoic structure of the fact that they are the supreme consciousness. They are the supreme intellect. Uh, this is unfortunate. It's a great vehicle you can find tremendous value in, and you can, you can hunt around for pieces of yourself that won't let go to anything. You won't, you know, uh, there's nothing that's superior to me. That isn't superior to me. I'm superior. You've got to distribute yourself of that somehow. And bhakti is a really powerful practice. It is not just for the Indians. It's not just for the people in Asia. It really is a powerful practice for any religion. Christians can do it. Anybody can do it. Just get past that. I can't possibly ever become Jesus. You can become Jesus. And what's interesting is, is that it dovetails with self-inquiry because when you have to look in and see, well, is there anything different from me, from Jesus, from Krishna, from Shiva? You have to make that inward turn. And when you make that inward turn, you see that there is no boundary. There is no, there is no difference. And as Gary's saying, oh, maybe you find some like little untended zone over here and then you feel it release because it's being released it's being given up to shiva it's being given up to krishna it's being given up to jesus whoever chooses you really and it it is something for you to surrender to because that, that's why i say they choose you and you don't need to believe in the veracity of these as external deities only that this is a very powerful uh self-programming technique if we want to put it that way and then you know once you experience it those words will be insufficient to the experience because it's so big yeah exactly and this is not a religious practice per se not at all and this is really about recognizing is there anything in this universe that i feel is superior to me vastly superior to me give it up to the earth just give, give, <laughs> give up to whatever works for you you can go to a mountain in the ocean but somehow disabuse yourself of the fact that you are different from all of this because the core mystical experience, psychedelic experience, non-dual experience is that everything is one thing. And any place you are different from this sense of I am different from something else is a place you're holding on. It's an attachment that you have, a belief that you have, that you are different from something else. And in fact, that's the ego. You are not different from everything else. You are everything else. It all is you. All is one thing. It's not God of the cosmos that's creating that sense of separation. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. Right? 
So only you can untie it from the inside out. The call is coming from within the house. Remember Halloween? Oh. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, so scary. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. Amazing. Uh, very quick uh, follow-up here, right, uh, from Omar asking, does bhakti lead to self-inquiry? If so, does mindful mindfulness have a similar effect ultimately? No, I, I don't think mindfulness does it. I mean, I, I, mindfulness is great for where it's being worked with right now in our society. There's tons of research coming out. It's a little stress relief, a focus, break the strain of stress in your course of your day. It's great for that. If somebody only has five minutes a day to practice, and that's all they can get their hands around, then it's better than nothing. It's a lot better than nothing. But I, mindfulness is not going to get you there. I mean, I've, I've been all around this from every possible angle. Unless you go into self-inquiry, there's just nothing to get at that ego. But it could bring up self-inquiry, couldn't it? Well, hopefully. I mean, bhakti will bring up self-inquiry. Yeah. We're just talking about that. If you're doing yeah. bhakti, you'll have a hard time not running into, oh, <laughs> I, I'm here, and, and that's out there. And I'm different from that. Very easy slip over into self inquiry versus, okay, where is that? Where is that thing mm. that is different from that thing? That's where self inquiry comes out of bhakti. But I haven't seen mindfulness you can hide out, in my experience, a long time, like <laughs> forever in mindfulness because you aren't going after the ego. You aren't going after the real problem of all your problems and your storylines and all your past angst. That's where they're buried. Who's being mindful? Yeah, you've got to go into it. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Omar, for that follow-up question. Thank you, Tara, for the initial question. Uh, really great here. Uh, amazing. Um, and I have a, another question here. It kind of seems to flow right from what you were talking about from Benjamin, who asks, I've read that Ramana Maharshi's first teaching was his physical presence and self-inquiry was only secondary. Just wondering if there's any evidence for this sort of effect and how well you guys feel it works over distance like this or through recordings. Yeah, you mean how he teaches? Yeah, but yes. His, his thing was uh, to really just teach in silence. And he just, he just sat there and people would come in. And he, the story or not, but he spent basically 50 years on this one not very large mountain in South India, and he mostly just sat still. We have lots of things. His talks is a PDF downloadable. Who am I is a downloadable PDF. Uh, you can get lots of teachings out of him, but he mostly sat in silence. And some of the big names at that time in the world came to see him. And some thought, whoa, this is awesome. This guy is absolutely the incarnation of Carl Jung said he's the whitest spot in the whitest space. Uh, just so, so overwhelmed many people, but not everybody. Some people came and they saw this guy lying on this couch with a little loincloth and just people sitting sitting around him quietly, nobody you know shouting or anything, just sitting around quietly in this little place in South India. Nothing remarkable. But he was on BBC, he was on Life magazine, he was in so many different places because there was an energy that he radiated that really was the profound teaching, but not many people can process that. As you get on down this path, it may come to you that you find out that you have some of that energy too. And you may find that it develops even where it comes from, you don't make it up, but people start to come around you. You don't know what they're doing, but they're coming in, they're more comfortable talking to you, they may be your friends, something's changed about Mary, What's going on with Mary? You know, I, well, spend some time with Mary. You don't know why, but Mary's changed. And so you're sitting around Mary, and things start to change for the people who are hanging around with Mary. And so it's that same energy that we don't like to talk about, but there is transmission is what Roman would call it. There is this sense that there are energies that can amazingly work on you in ways you wouldn't have imagined. Things can change in your life just by hanging around these people. I don't like to talk about it because it turns, you know, people into have, you know, special people and non-special people. And there's a, that's very easily abused, very quickly abused. We've abused it historically many, many, many times, even with our lifetime. But I don't like to talk about that, but it does happen. If you can find somebody you can hang around with that has satsang of you, you have the energy that you feel from them when you're around them, 
and you find yourself getting a little clearer and things start to happen in your life, yes, that happens. And that's what Ramana really taught, but not many people can access that. And a lot of people can't give that at all. And to, to sort of flip it around, it's kind of amazing that we're at a spot where we doubt that interaction with another human being outside of words could heal us, right? You know, I mean, we, we, we are in interaction with each other. Uh, and, you know, I don't think we know exactly what is going on when we're in interaction. I mean, I'm reminded of early research when video cameras first became available that saw that, you know, infants, if you slow down the video, infants are more or less connected to their parents by these kind of invisible in an invisible dance, right? Whereas if it was going too fast, you can't see it. Of course, we're connected to each other. Of course, these kinds of transformations can happen. Um, and we can do this with each other every day with the person we're sitting next to on a bus or, you know, walking next to this kind of transmission is our kind of lifeblood in many ways. Um, but as Gary was saying, we can't really receive it if there's all this blah, blah, blah going on all the time. And so the, the first job is to engage self-inquiry so that we can actually be capable of experiencing what's right in front of us, which is really this, this energy that everybody has. But the more we get out of the way of that energy, the more we wither our own internal self-referential uh, thought, the more it seems to come forth. And this kind of goes back to now, 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 and how you can check on this thing. This is really about coherence. And if you've got self referential narrative going on, you're probably decoherent. You're out of phase with everything. You've got your own phase going on, and nobody's hooked up to you. As you get less and less of that, you find you begin to develop your own kind of coherence, your own kind of stability, your own kind of frequency. There's less perturbation in your energy level. And so this is what makes you know your life better. And if people come around you, they kind of sense you aren't nuts. <laughs> <laughs> or they think you are. Or they think you are. <laughs> but but you know, they can feel that you're not decoherent. You're not inauthentic. You're actually being authentic with who you are. They may not like it, they may think it's crazy, but at least you're being authentic to what your reality is. You're not something that you, you're not pretending to be something that you aren't. You're just authentically real, coherent. With your true nature. This very, very to yourself, very powerful, and perhaps to others. But I wouldn't, don't aim for the others. Just get yourself into coherence, take care of your own business, and stuff will happen or not happen out of your control. And last little bit, sorry, Jennifer, was just what do we think about whether or not this works, you know, over webinar and recordings? And that's, that's what of, I was going to ask, yeah. That's yeah. So. Uh, I, I can always say that it seems to, and that uh, it seems to work in books. Uh, but again, I think that whether or not it works depends on getting into that coherent state oneself. And if we'll wither ourselves, we can receive all kinds of teachings from the cosmos. You know, there's the the saying that was extraordinarily appropriate for when I first met uh, Gary, which is, "When the student is ready, the teacher appears." When when we wither our own internal narrative enough, we will receive that the, te the teachings that the cosmos are giving us. And some of those teachings will be live, some will be recorded, some will be in books, but we'll receive them. And it, it does seem to work, depending upon what you're saying, on the coherence of the person who's on the other end of the line. Beautiful, wonderful. It's uh, We're all co-creating this uh, Yes. yes, exactly. It's a co-creation. Nice. Love that. Uh, I think we have time, if you guys are okay, for one more question. I'm not going to be able to get to everyone's question today, but I'm going through as many as I can. Do you? Are you guys okay for one more, or uh, we're kind of at the end of the time here? Just let me know either way. For sure. Pardon? For sure. Oh, for sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, you guys have talked about different psychedelics before. This is from Jor Jory uh, asked this question. You guys have talked about different psychedelics before. Do you have any comments on salvia div divinorum as a tool on the path? Any ongoing research? Some people report that it helps them with their practice. 
Well, you know, uh, what, there was an interesting Richard Strassman, who, of course, uh, did the DMT, the spirit molecule book and then movie and did the research in the early 90s at University of New Mexico with DMT. Uh, my memory is that he did some follow up also with Salvi and he was going to have a study that was studying the effect of low doses of salvia leaf um, smoked in as an adjunct to meditation. Um, I don't know whatever became of that. Um, I will say anecdotally that one thing about salvia that uh, I would just put out there is that sometimes uh, people get involved with these very powerful extracts and they're sort of chasing an experience and not working on gently unwinding themselves. Uh, and they can get blasted into kind of an alternate dimension uh, for a very short period of time. And it that doesn't seem to really be very beneficial uh, to the practice. Um, however, probably once a month, I get an email from somebody saying that they're working with Salvia. But a lot of times it has this kind of, it seems to have this kind of effect where Woohoo, everything clicks and then it kind of fades. So what I all I would say is, is that open to the way in which the cosmos is teaching you and, you know, really work on withering that inter internal self-referential narrative. And then whatever Salvia has to teach you, it will be capable of teaching you. You know, just as we were saying, the it, you know, the, the transmission only works if there's coherence on the other side, I think the same thing has to be true also of plant teachers. I can say in my own experience that I couldn't learn anything from cannabis for the first probably 15 years that I used it. I had to learn how to be open to what it was teaching me. And so it's less the substance or the plant teacher that is crucial here than it is um, you know, what is our set and setting? What is our state of mind? What is our practice that goes into the use or encounter, I would call it, with that plant teacher? So I would say salvia, very interesting plant. It seems to have a different kind of presence and profile than uh, other ones that uh, I have uh, experienced. Um, the last thing I'll say about it is that somebody I know who works very well with it does not smoke it, but uses the cud method, which is, I think, the it, traditional indigenous way of working with it, which is you chew on, you put some between your cheek and gum, and then when you feel it coming on, when you feel that you're at the place where you want to be, you spit it out, and it's a much slower, more manageable experience from which it seems like you can learn more, but everyone is different. Uh, I would caution, say to use caution, extreme caution with the extracts. Yeah, I'm a complete novice virgin at this, as you guys know. Uh, there is a study going on at Johns Hopkins, not on salvia, but on psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and meditation. Uh, they just started that in full scale. Now some of the people on the line right now uh, are participating in that study. So uh, we may get some good results out of that sometime fairly soon. It's a very top-notch effort. That will be the closest good look we have at a carefully controlled environment with uh, chemically pure psilocybin plus or minus meditation. So we should have some good information out of that. It will be a while, but that's the best good data we have coming. Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, lots of amazing studies happening right now, and uh, it will be interesting to see what even the next few months bring. Jory, thank you for the question. Jory uh, writes, thank you, and what you you answered makes sense. So, appreciate that. Uh, I think we're at the we well, I don't think we are at the the end of the the time here. So, if you guys had any closing words, it's been an amazing episode with such great questions and you guys giving amazing answers. So, I just want to leave you if you have any final words here. Oh, actually, and, and maybe as you're giving those, if you could mention the name of the chant that you were doing before the session started? A few people were asking about that. Oh, it's actually online. If you go to uh, my channel, or just put in shut up and chant, shut up and chant. Yeah. Uh, what you'll get are he and I chanting that, and it's annotated with the actual words in English and in Sanskrit, transliterated. 
you can go through that yourself. <laughs> and, uh, also, I've got a sound, uh, SoundCloud channel. It's also on the SoundCloud channel with my name. Uh, you can find it there as well. So, yeah, we strongly encourage it. It's a thought, fantastic practice. It's in Happiness Beyond Thought, the actual text of it. It's one of the best uh, non-dual chants you could ever imagine. Fantastic thing. Really, really important part of my practice is uh, chanting. And uh, only thing I would say also in closing is just gratitude for the questions. I think what's interesting is that this is an inquiry path. And as people open to the importance of questioning and, and allowing those questions out and seeing the kind of dialogue that we can have through those questions, we're, we're automatically kind of supercharging the inquiry process because we see that it is made of questions. And... Uh, I'm grateful for them. Yeah, we are co-creating this, as you said, which is really key. This is a co-creation, and that's an important part people need to understand. We're all working on this thing together. Absolutely, and you can feel that today very strongly, and I want to thank everyone again. Uh, in addition to their questions, their comments, and support of one another, really a beautiful space here in, uh, that, that's been created, and that's, again, a co-creation. So, Gary and Rich, super amazing gratitude to both of you. It's, uh, I, I never have words at the end of this. I'm always flustered because it's just, you know, sometimes there aren't any words, and that's just... Uh, a great place to be in actually the way I feel best is when I and maybe I'll just after this shut up and chant. Yeah. <laughs> Na cha vyo ma bhumi na te jo na vayu Chetananda rupaha shivoham shivoham Awesome. Mm, thank you. Thank you everyone. We'll see you next time, and uh, the recording will be out shortly. We'll have that sent to everyone, and again, um, uh, we did put the link in the chat, and you'll be receiving an email. If you can contribute anything, uh, it's not required. Uh, this has been gifted to us by these two amazing gentlemen, and we're thankful for that, but to help pay for the tech and uh, you know, just the the tools we're using here, it would be great if you could contribute something. If you're able, we sent that, put that link in the chat, and we'll be sending an email out to you all. And we will keep you informed about next the next date, we're trying to do these as close to the first Sunday of each month, depending on everyone's schedule, but we're going, that's our intention. And so we'll be in touch about next time. Thank you again, and thank you, Chris Kaplan, my colleague, and everyone on the session, and of course, Gary and Rich. See you soon. Thank you.